to our worship and great fellowship this morning. On this Father's Day, we want to begin by acknowledging what our Heavenly Father has done for us. And I love, one of my favorite verses is 1 John 1, verse 3. Or 1 John 3, verse 1, I'm sorry. It says, see how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. And I always love it that, and I think every version that I know, it ends with an exclamation point. It's just such an emphatic statement. We are God's children. So I invite you to join us this morning in praising God our Father for what he has done for us through Jesus Christ and that we can be called his children.
Father's Day, and welcome to Grace Fellowship. You are a child of God, and your Father in Heaven deeply loves you. We are going to do something a little bit different today. We're inviting you, as you're seated, to take off your masks and to talk to your neighbors. And so feel free to just take a seat and talk to those around you. Kind of consider that whoever you're seated next to is who God wanted you to encourage and say good morning to. And also, while you're doing that, log on to Facebook. Yeah, we're going to get on our, our smartphones. And go to the service and click on it and say good morning to your neighbors on there. The brothers and sisters who aren't with us today, we want to be connected to the whole family of God. And stay on that service because during the sermon, we're going to do things a little different today. I'm actually asking you to be on your smartphones the entire time I preach. We're going to be lifting up prayers to God with our, with our brothers and sisters at home. We're going to be praying for each other. If you need healing of body, heart, mind, and soul, if there's somebody that God has put on your mind to pray for, list them, put them there, let's share these things, and let's see what God does. If you've got a praise to share, a thanksgiving Post that there too, but let's stay where we're at and say good morning to our neighbors. And a, a couple of words of wisdom. I would turn the volume down on the feed so that it doesn't like reverb around the room as we're doing what we're doing this morning. But yes, yeah, say good morning to your neighbors on Facebook. Powerless. Merriam-Webster defines the word powerless as to be devoid of strength or resources and lacking the capacity to help. And powerless was how I felt as the pointed at the 32 nodules on the CAT scan that were on my lungs. And powerless as words like non-Hodgkin's and lymphoma bounced around in my head. And powerless as those who were in the room talked about me, but not to me. Powerless. As I was wondering, is this some kind of bad dream? This can't be real. I am not here. I need to get out of here. Powerless as I realized there's no running away from this. Powerless as panic overtook me and anxiety attacked and suddenly I felt like I couldn't breathe, like I was in a hole that was getting smaller and smaller, and there was no escape. Powerless. Have you ever felt that way? Do you feel that way right now? 
you feel that way right now about somebody you care for and love and you wish you could help them, do you feel powerless? Let's, let's share that on here. Let's be real with God and real with each other. Let's tell God when we feel devoid of strength and resources and lacking a capacity to help. Which is a pretty accurate description of the man in our story this morning in Acts chapter 3, which you can read on the screen overhead. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. This man who could not walk since birth, his only means in the first century Roman world to provide for himself was to beg for charity. And I can imagine him waking up every day on his back and having a feeling that his life is going nowhere. Or at least he has no way to get there. He has to wait for others, for people to come and get him, and they know where they're taking him. To the same place they took him yesterday and the day before that. To the gate called Beautiful at Herod's temple. And he would just sit there from sun up till sundown, just hoping to catch somebody's eye, hoping that those who are there to make sacrifices before God and lift up prayers that these upstanding citizens would, would show compassion. And I imagine most people would just walk right past him. They would talk about him, but not to him. And so there he sat, devoid of strength and resources, lacking the capacity to help himself, powerless. And I'm reminded of a man who was sitting outside a grocery store in Washington, this sunburned, hunched-over man in a wheelchair, and he held up a sign, and it, it said um, it was asking for money. And so we went in the grocery store, and we got a sandwich and some peanut butter crackers and some water. And on the way out, we gave them to him, only to discover he couldn't eat the crackers because of a peanut allergy, and he couldn't eat the sandwich because of a dairy allergy. And you might be thinking, well, beggars can't be choosers. But when EpiPens cost $900 a needle, you can choose whether to eat something that will send you an anaphylactic shock. It's no wonder he was holding up the sign asking just for money. I mean, I guess he could have put, FYI, I'm allergic to legumes and dairy, but I imagine most people don't read a wordy sign. I think he just tried to keep it short and simple, just hoping that someone would give him the time of day, much like this man. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him as he did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. I could imagine he had been there all day trying to get people's attention. And now these guys want his attention. What is going on here? And then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth walk. And here he was just hoping for an easy handout, and these guys are offering him something that he could only dream of. Let's lift up those kind of prayers. Let's lift up the kind of prayers on here that reveal the things we could only dream of. And I think about my mother-in-law, Pat, who went into the comfort house a couple of days ago, and she's not eaten or drank in a couple of days and I think about what I could only dream of for her. And you see, it's perfectly Christian to pray for the things we could only dream of. Don't let anyone tell you differently. Because our God is in the business of miracles. So let's also share those. Let's share the miracles we've seen Jesus perform. Let's praise the Lord. I've got one I'll share. When I was a youth pastor, there was this high schooler who got in a horrific car accident because he was texting while driving. And his, uh, his brain trauma was so bad they had to induce a coma. And it didn't look good. And there were all these different prayer vigils and people were trying to hold out hope. And by a miracle, he pulled through. And I say by a miracle, not to discount medical science because God makes miracles happen through medical science as well. 
And every single thing that happened from that point on was a miracle. From the first blinking of his eyes to the first nod of his head to the first words spoken. And I still remember the look in his mother's face as he was taking his first steps again. She did not want silver or gold. She just wanted her child to walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. And here we see our Father in heaven, he only wanted one thing. He didn't want to give this child of God another handout. He wanted to give him strength, the power of God. You see, the power of God is, is not devoid of strength. It is not lacking resources or the capacity to help. Let's pray for that kind of power. Let's pray for that kind of strength for ourselves and for people that we are caring about, we are worried about right now. Who needs that kind of strength? Who feels broken, afflicted, fatigued, and here and here and in body? Let's lift up those names right now. Have you ever been filled with the strength of God? It makes you feel like you can do things you've never done before, like you can run and dance with abandon. So he jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. And those who are witnessing this, they cannot believe what they're seeing with their own two eyes. And sometimes seeing is not believing. C.S. Lewis talks about this in the book Miracles. He says, In my life I have met only one person who claims to have seen a ghost. And the interesting thing about the story is that that person disbelieved in the immortal soul before she saw the ghost and still disbelieves after seeing it. She says that what she saw must have been an illusion or a trick of the nerves. And obviously she may be right, seeing is not believing. And for this reason, the question of whether miracles occur can never be answered simply by experience. Every event which might claim to be a miracle is, in the last resort, something presented to our senses. Something seen, heard, touched, smelled, tasted. And our senses are not infallible. If anything extraordinary seems to have happened, we can always say that we've been victims of an illusion. If we hold a philosophy that excludes the supernatural, this is what we will probably say. What we learn from experience depends on the kind of philo philosophy we begin to experience and we bring into that experience. It is therefore useless to appeal to experience before we have settled, as well as we can, the philosophical question. And what Lewis is saying here is this. If what we see with our own two eyes defies our perception of logic and reality, we will struggle to believe what we are witnessing. But if we see God at work and we believe that he is a miracle worker, then making a connection to what's happening out here and what happens in here becomes more natural. Case in point, I remember at a follow-up doctor's appointment, the doctor showing me a new CAT scan and the next day's biopsy was canceled. 28 of the 32 nodules disappeared. And I just, I felt like jumping and dancing. I felt like running with abandon. My mom, the nurse, she wanted an explanation. She was struggling to believe what she saw with her own two eyes. And with the doctor, he had a theory, but I knew. I knew why the nodules were gone. My anxiety attacks were also gone. I had the truth. And this truth is the same explanation that Peter and John give to those gathered around them. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob... The God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. And you handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he
to let him go. He disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses to this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. And there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. We see the church in Acts and they pray for mighty things in the name of Jesus. And it's by this name that the sick are healed. It's by this name that the powers of darkness are exercised. It's by this name that even the dead are raised back to life. Do you know that when you invoke the name of Jesus, you are invoking a powerful name that can do immeasurably more than you could ever ask for or imagine? Yet sometimes we, we treat it like a toast, like we end it with a prayer, like we, um, in Jesus' name we pray, as if uh, it's just a nice bookend to something we've been saying. Or even worse, we treat it like a Hail Mary pass to God, something we just throw up there hoping that it'll stick. But we don't put our eggs in that basket. And I had a friend who experienced this very problem at a prayer meeting before his church service. And he realized pretty quickly that everybody in the room, or not everybody, but a lot of people in the room were struggling to believe in divine intervention. At least least on the big things. I know small stuff. They had they had no problem praying for God to do something, which is very ironic. When it came to the big things, they, they would say, Lord, your will be done. And so they they prayed for someone who had just had ingrown toenail surgery, and they boldly prayed for a quick recovery. But when it came to the church member with cancer, they said, so-and-so has cancer. Lord, let your will be done. My friend, he grew really tired of this charade. He took his Bible and he slammed it on the table. And he said, when you pray, you pray with faith. You pray believing that Jesus is Lord of all, that he has power over every cell in your body. When you pray in Jesus' name, you pray with faith. You pray believing that he is Savior and can save you. Because if Jesus is not Lord of all, and if Jesus can't save you, there's no point in praying. You are wasting your breath. Let me say that again. If Jesus is not Lord of all, and he can't save you, There's no point in praying. You are wasting your breath. And I think it's important that we we take that phrase, your will be done, and we put it in its appropriate context. When Jesus teaches us that that phrase to pray, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What Jesus is actually saying is that we ought to be praying that it is on earth like it's in heaven. He's actually telling us to pray that God puts this world to rights. That in the face of illness, we boldly pray for healing of body, heart, mind, and soul. That in the face of cancer and Parkinson's and SIDS, that we pray, believing that it's God's will for it to be here like it is in heaven. Can I get an amen? But what about the times when you prayed for healing? You prayed hoping to see a glimpse of that kingdom and it seemed like nothing happened. I think about sitting with a young man named Scott after his mother died from her second bout of cancer and looking back at all the times we prayed for healing and wondered why. On the flip side, I remember sitting on a couch with a couple as they were sharing that the wife's latest CAT scan came back and the cancer was gone. The chemo had worked and she was healed. And a couple months later, I remember sitting on another couch with another husband as his wife was crying out in pain in the room next to us because of colon cancer. And within a few days, this infirmity would take her. Why? One of my favorite theologians Derek Murphy, he talks about this in his book, Breakthrough, this conundrum. 
he says, why are some people he- not healed? Is it because of the faith of the sick person is in- insufficient? Is it because the person who prays is not anointed or gifted at that time? Is there a sin or unforgiveness in his life? These are some of the questions that are raised when one attempts to grapple with the evident fact that there's no logical relationship between the actual occurrence of healing and the amount of faith, anointing, or gifting. In praying for healing, the the batting average of some is better than others. And certainly faith is a vital factor. Jesus made this plain. We know that there are gifts of healing. We also know that there are moments when we sense a moving of the Holy Spirit and are not surprised when a healing takes place. The problem is that so many real healings have been an unlikely combination of factors, yet so many likely combinations do not produce healing. The mystery of the kingdom is the only biblical explanation that fits the facts. And having understood this, we will see why insisting on other explanations is actually cruel and a lack of spiritual perception. And then he says, When the Holy Spirit was poured out, the powers of the age to come broke through. The result was the gifts of healing were seen. The presence of the Holy Spirit is synonymous with the perfect rule of God, which is synonymous with healing. When a person is healed, it means the power of the future kingdom has broken through into the present. Every healing is a kingdom breakthrough. And then he says in the moments when someone isn't healed, it's a reminder that we still need that kingdom to come in its fullness. And he goes a little bit further. He makes the point that whether somebody is healed today or they are inevitably healed when God's kingdom comes in its fullness, it is God's inevitable will that everyone in Christ be healed. Let me say that again. Whether somebody is healed today or they are healed when Jesus' kingdom comes in its fullness, it is God's inevitable will, will that they be healed. And it's not our job to figure out which one. It's our job to pray with boldness to pray believing that anyone can be healed, and to pray believing that everyone will be healed when Jesus' kingdom comes. And I think, I think about this when I visit someone in the hospital. I get this sense of anticipation and excitement. How might the kingdom of God break through when we pray together in Jesus' name? I have this friend, when he prays for healing for someone, he actually keeps his eyes open the entire time because he wants to wait and see what God does. It's with that kind of bold faith that we are not devoid of strength. It's with that kind of bold faith that we are not lacking a resource. We are not lacking a helper. We are not powerless because there is power in the name of Jesus. The church has been endowed with a name that has power to move mountains and break chains. And every time we pray, For signs and wonders, we ought to anticipate an inbreaking of that future kingdom. Because that's what happens here in this passage in Acts. Do you realize that this beggar who went to the gate called Beautiful actually experienced one of the prophet Isaiah's prophecies about the kingdom of God come true? They get a glimpse of the future. It says in Isaiah that the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And then the, the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. He went to this place just hoping for money, and he got to experience a glimpse of this prophecy come true, a picture of that future kingdom. You see, signs and wonders and healing and miracles, they are part and parcel to praying, thy kingdom come. And it's like my brother Verlin said today in prayer before the service, if, Verlin, you might have to remind me, he was reading, um, quoting Hebrews, and he said, if, go for it, where are you at? Without faith, it means nothing. And the truth is, I dare say, if, if we are praying, like we see Peter and John with an incredible faith, we actually put ourselves in pole position to experience an inbreaking of that kingdom, a sense of anticipation. And we see that this church in Acts, they know that they're living on the cusp of a dawning of a new age. And it's in the, a couple chapters later, in chapter 5, it says, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. And no one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, 
More and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. And as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. And crowds gathered also fr- as he passed by. C- crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Let's pray in Jesus' name. On Facebook, let's share people we want to pray for, people we're worried about, people we want to see God perform a sign and wonder in. Let's pray with faith. If you feel broken, if you are struggling with depression or grief, let's pray that the great counselor gives you peace beyond understanding you find yourself right now feeling stuck and lacking strength and feeling devoid of resources and lacking a capacity to help, let's pray that the power of God wells up inside you. If you have any infirmity, any bad diagnosis, any reoccurring injury, let's pray for that in Jesus' mighty name. And in a minute, after we're sharing these things, we're going to have a chance to pray, to pray to Jesus, who is our strength, our resource, our helper, our Lord and Savior. Father, we, we lift up our brothers and sisters to you. We pray for healing in your mighty name. We pray with faith, longing to see an inbreaking of your kingdom, longing to see your glory. And we believe. We believe you heal now. We, we believe in the holistic healing we'll experience in your kingdom when every square inch on this earth will be like heaven. We know that's your will. We pray for Trudy. We pray for Dell. We pray for Herb and Margaret. As Herb has just entered hospice, God, we lift him up. We lift up Pat, who's at the Comfort House this morning. We pray, Jesus. We pray right now that she feels covered, that Herb feels covered by your presence. We pray for Dale. Lord, we pray for, we pray for, pray against cancer. We long for therapies to work like they're supposed to. Guide the physicians, guide the surgeons, be with them. We pray for miracles. We pray for that kingdom to break through. We pray for Christy's grandma right now, Jesus. We lift her up to you as she's lamenting the death of her grandpa. We pray for Norma and her whole family as well in their emptiness, in the moments when their hearts hurt, when it becomes hard to swallow, Jesus, come alongside them. Help them to know you are weeping with them. We pray for Isaac's family right now as they're mourning a loss as well. Jesus, walk them through that moment. We know that in the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. Pray for those who feel powerless, knowing that God has got them. We pray for those people having surgery, biopsy, medical treatments this week. We pray for Pat, Mike, and the Allen family. We pray for Dell. Jesus, we pray, knowing what you did at the gate called beautiful. We pray in your mighty name, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Nazareth. We pray, Lord, for healing, for signs and wonders. Give us faith. Where we have disbelief, Lord, give us more faith. We know your faithfulness is great when our faith is lacking, when it is small. We believe.
believe in you, Jesus. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. May it be on earth. May it be in these lives that we've lifted up to you like it is in heaven. We need you, Jesus. Amen.
So be after the blessing, we're going to ask that you come around here and just stand on one of these steps right here and just wave at our brothers and sisters who are at home and miss you. And uh, so feel free, to, feel free to just pull your mask to the side and say good morning to them as you're heading out to enjoy Father's Day. And we just want to remind you, the offering basket is on the gathering space over there. And also we have a basket for the absentee ballots for those who can't make it next week. So feel free to put those there, but let me, uh, let's receive the blessing. On Father's Day, may we be surrounded by our Father in Heaven's love and presence. May we put our faith in the great physician, Jesus, and may we pray for signs and wonders in the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people say, I think so. Wait, but you saw it on your map. Oh, it's a camera. It's a camera. It's a camera. Hi. Happy Father's Day. We miss you. Good morning from the same day. Don't have to go on the side. Just play with it. Cool.
<laughs> yes, he really is my son. Yeah. 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 Yeah.